Okay, we're about to head back into our Bible study in Ephesians 4.13, but before we begin this morning, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's the time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's bow our heads together for a few moments, and I'll finish us out in group prayer. We're studying in Ephesians 4.13, and I'm going to read uh, probably 13 and 14 this morning. It uh, encompasses the subject of Christian maturity, and it's the purpose of the ministry. Ephesians 4.13 says this, Till we all come to the unity of doctrine and of the full knowledge, epinosis, of the Son of God, to a perfect man, mature man, teleios. What is a mature Christian? To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So Christ-likeness is the goal. Christian way of life. Verse 14, that we should no longer be children, napios, babies, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, that means we won't fall in the trap of false doctrine, and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in the love complex, the divine, divine dinosphere, may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. And so we see God wants us to grow up so we're studying Christian maturity. I'm going to share with you again a couple of diagrams that we need to know and understand. You not seeing that? Okay, so the sophisticated spiritual life is the first diagram, and we work the equation here. Spiritual self-esteem, and that's knowing who you are in Christ. That's the beginning of maturity, gate five, plus cognitive self-confidence. And self-confidence is... Finally, understanding your own spiritual life and when who God says you are. Plus, problem-solving device number seven and number eight. Which is personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind. Plus providential preventative suffering, that's the thorn in the flesh to keep you from becoming arrogant, equals spiritual autonomy. And this is where you begin to stand on your own two feet spiritually. Plus cognitive independence, that means you can think for yourself now in the Christian way of life. Plus problem solving device. Number nine is sharing the happiness of God. You no longer try to get happiness from people or things or circumstances. Plus, momentum testing in four areas. That's people, thought, system, and disaster testing equals spiritual maturity. Now, this area, MT4, is where we're going to spend some time this morning. Final part of the equation is spiritual maturity plus cognitive invincibility plus problem-solving device number 10, that's occupation with Christ, plus evidence testing equals glorification of God in time. And so there is the three stages of spiritual adulthood. 
and obviously there's quite a bit of ground there that you cover in your own spiritual life even having broke in to super grace status there is still much ground to cover even after the beginning of maturity now let's let's apply our uh, what we know here to the divine dinosphere this is your spiritual life in the church age this is the bottom circle and this is what we get when we begin to develop our spiritual life first of all we have gate one the power gate filling of the holy spirit this is where the believer operates clean from his own priesthood and now he has god the holy spirit fulfilling his sevenfold ministry in his life then he can begin to function in gate two which is basic christian methods of operation where he begins to learn the basics of the faith rest drill and um, impersonal love objectivity the ten problem solving devices gate three is the humility gate it's uh, equals teachability gate four is the function of gap and that's where we learn doctrine and when you finally get all four of these hitting when you're hitting on all four cylinders you can begin to produce some momentum some power in the christian way of life and that brings you around into spiritual adulthood where you begin to love god because of all he has done for you where you can impersonally love all mankind because you have developed integrity and then that brings you out into momentum testing and this is the no man's land of the christian way of life where you go at it alone and god is going to give you some warm-up tests before he brings you over into maturity and places you in the witness stand uh, for the prosecution in the appeal phase of satan's trial and so what we've been looking at is the idea that when the believer grows to spiritual maturity he enters a area right here in gates five and six it's called super grace and there's nothing bad about that this christian has grown up and he is loving god and in uh purity it's it's real and he is learning how to love other people yeah, because of who he is and so this is a super grace life but the truth is there's a desert to cross before this believer gets to actually the full essence of the christian way of life ultra super grace where he's going to take the witness stand and so this morning we're going to talk about no man's land and how the believer is now going to cross the desert and he's going to take a bunch of warm-up tests before he can take the witness stand there in gate 8. So I need you to turn all the way back in your Bible, way back to Exodus 14. There was a lot of different ways to do this. I could talk to you about all the different momentum tests. Four main, eight total. Add a bunch of notes. <clears throat> but you know, that's not, that's not the way I like to fly. If I can give you an example from Scripture, I'd rather do that. And what we're going to look at I think what I want to do right here, I want to give you a whiteboard first before we go into this. And that whiteboard, there it is.
we're going to relate the testing of Israel in the desert and your own spiritual life and what we're going to see is is that up here in Egypt every Israelite that came out of Egypt was born again every adult but he did not go right to the promised land God led him into the wilderness or the desert and over here was the promised land and so when we see over here the Passover we're going to see that every adult took Passover that was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and he was born again and God is going to bring him out across the Red Sea and he's going to bring him right into the wilderness and right out here is where momentum testing is going to occur we're going to look at 10 different tests that God brought Israel in the desert before he brought Israel into the promised land and so <clears throat> if you're going to relate this to your life you're going to see that you were born again right up here and God has designed the promised land for you this is Christian maturity this is where the uh, land of milk and honey is but before you can enter the place of milk and honey, God is going to test you in the wilderness and make sure that you have the uh, tools necessary to slay the giant once you enter the promised land because the, uh, the, the promised land is where the giants live. And God's not going to bring you in there to be pummeled by giants until you're ready to take over the promised land and be able to enjoy the fruits of maturity. And so let's take a look at the story in Exodus 14. We're going to have the Israelites coming out of Egypt and going following Moses. And I love the story because uh, there's always some sarcasm. I'm going to look at verse 10. The Pharaoh and the Pharaoh's armies are pursuing the Israelites across the desert. <clears throat> and it says in verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And so this was the very first right application that they made. They cried out to the Lord. And so we're going to see that God is going to deliver them in grace. But they have it right so far and then they get it wrong. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, had you taken us away to die in the wilderness? And so... Sarcasm is all, it's the story of Israel in the desert is full of sarcasm. Why have you dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? And um, the truth is that God delivered them from Egyptian slavery and they were so quick to forget the whips and the taskmasters and the cruel cruelty of the Egyptians. Verse 12, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And so <clears throat> the problem with slavery is, is that you, as a slave, you may not know how to uh, enjoy freedom. And freedom is the environment uh, for progress. But the problem is, is that uh, freedom is a big, uh, scary thing. And so the Israelites here are in the desert and they're free. And it's kind of a scary thing to think now God is going to have to take care of us. In verse 13, we have test number one. 
The test is fear. The test is fear. The solution is the faith rest drill. So test number one is the fear test. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And so we have to, first of all, learn the faith rest drill, and that's trusting the promises of God. We have to claim a promise, develop a rationale, and form a conclusion. Now, what we have to apply right now is, is see, what is it in life that would cause you to worry? What is it in life that would cause you to fear? What is it in life that would give you anxiety? What is it that you are supposed to be trusting God with? See, there are certain things that are out of our control. And that's why he says, stand still. He says, do nothing. This is out of your control. There's nothing that you can do to uh, uh, fix this situation. You have to stand still and you have to watch the deliverance of God. And God will bring us to our own Red Sea where we have no escape, where we must trust in Him. And that's where we use the faith for us drill. That's where we stop and we stand still and we watch the deliverance of God. And so, uh, I, I want to read the story because it's uh, too wonderful to skip over here. In verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall, shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you... Cry to me, tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall fall after them. I will gain honor over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. And so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one it gave light by night to the other so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right and on the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels and drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And so we see the deliverance of God and uh, the proclamation of Moses is that God is a, uh, that the Lord is a God of war. In other words, he baited the greatest army in the world. He baited them and uh, he remained uh, in the tactical advantage and caused 
It was a tactical double envelopment where they made contact, drew back, and then closed in on both sides. And that's why Moses says, the Lord is a God of war. And so when the Israelites saw the deliverance of God, they saw that God had defeated the greatest army in the world. They should have known at that point that God would do anything to deliver them. He could do anything. And so we must also look back at this and say, okay, am I alive? Am I standing here? Do I have everything I need? Has God delivered us? Yes, He has. He's delivered us at salvation. And He's given us everything we need to live the Christian way of life. So we can stand back and we can also see the deliverance of God. Now, this was the one point that every Israelite witness, remember, every adult went across dry shod. They crossed the sea. And they saw the deliverance of God. It was a miracle. They had water on their right and their left. It was an amazing sight to see this. And they came out the other side, and the Egyptian army drowned. Every adult saw the deliverance that should have been firmly established in their mind. And that was the failure of the nine other tests, that they did not take the basis of the Red Sea incident and apply it to every test they came to in life. And we also, when we come to the people test, we ought to say, God's already delivered me. He's given me what I need. I'm going to pass. When we come to the thought test, the system test, the disaster test, every one of them we have the basis of our own deliverance. Now, test number two comes in verse 22. Test number two is mental attitude bitterness. We saw test number one is fear. We overcome fear through the faith rest drill. Test number two is mental attitude bitterness. The solution is believe the word. So Moses brought, this is verse 22 in chapter 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So this is their bitter mental attitude. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the water, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And he said, you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight. Give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And so the first test was the test of bitter water. Uh, that after the Red Sea, I, say, I should say that's test number two that they took. The solution is believe in the Word. And it's easy to get caught up into negative thinking. You know, we can get on a trend in our lives of being uh, sour about everything that comes around. And... Uh, you know, it's it's a lot. There's a lot of believers that have sour grapes, and it's attitudes are infectious. Is yours worth catching? Is the question, and um, we can choose to complain, whine, and uh, criticize, or we can choose to see the good in everything. And obviously, bitter water is something that uh, the solution was 
to drop the branch in and what we have to do every once in a while in our Christian way of life is stop and uh, get out the same stick Moses got out to change our attitudes on life and many times it's as easy as stopping to look and see how God has delivered us uh, all the way up to this point in our lives and certainly we have a lot to be thankful for and test test number three is in chapter 16 test number three is can God provide can God provide and the answer is yes logistical grace In chapter 16, and they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of, of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt, when the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, the flesh pots, and when we ate the bread to full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, whole assembly with hunger. Well, they couldn't remember that uh, Pharaoh told them to make bricks without straw. They couldn't remember falling out dead under the cruel amount of labor that they had been uh, put under. They couldn't remember their ancestors. But still today, you can dig up graves in Egypt and you can tell who were the slaves and who were the elite. You know how? By looking at their bones. Their bones, all the cartilage was gone out of the slave bones and all the, all the joints had flat spots under the cruel labor they were under, and they can't remember any of this. God had delivered them from slavery. They're out in freedom. God's providing for them. And all they're doing is complain. And so, can God provide? The question is, if, if God weans you off of filet mignon and the finest wine in the world over to graham crackers and peanut butter, are you going to complain, see? They had the flesh pots in Egypt. They were big mason jars that they would drop all of the ingredients down in. They'd put it on a slow simmer and they'd seal it off. It was like the crock pot of the day. And it was a big feast. And that's all they can remember. They might have only done that once in their lifetime. But that's all they can remember in the desert. Then the Lord said to Moses. Behold I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. That I may test them. Whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day when they shall prepare what they bring in. It shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And so this is the manna that God is going to provide. It was the perfect food. It was a honey wafer that fell from heaven. And they didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to grind it up. They didn't have to do anything but go out and collect it. And it had every element that they needed for survival and health and uh, it was the perfect food for the Israelites and we're going to find out that God has provided everything we need and that uh, to be able to make it in this life more than enough We need to remember that uh, uh, it's funny because, you know, there's there's always been uh, problems in human history with with uh, disasters. 
and national disasters are are recorded in history for us a lot and uh when when you get into a national disaster food can be a problem there's shortages and did you know that uh a lot of people get real nasty about the uh, things when when the food gets cut back and did you know well the real you is not you when everything is going right the real you is you under pressure you see you need to remember that and uh, right now everything is great because you can get all of your favorite things and you have clean water running out of the tap and that everything is fine and good but the question is uh, when there is adversity, if it comes, will the real you pop out? And uh, what's going to happen when you get under a little pressure? Will you be like the Egyptians and remember the flesh pots of Egypt? Or will you thank God for His provision in that day? You see, the lack of thankfulness. And the, the idea is that God can provide logistical grace for us we just don't know what logistical grace is for the day today it may be wonderful tomorrow it may be the bare necessities but god will provide so that's test number three test number four comes in chapter 17 test number four is obedience a dead end that's a question test number four for israel is obedience a dead end then all the congregation of the children of israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the lord and camped in rephidim but there was no water for the people to drink now here's interesting because they they followed the pillar of cloud by day and the uh fire by night so they knew they were going in the right direction they weren't lost because there was a fire or the cloud and there was moses with the staff and he was following the cloud and the fire and they were following moses and they were under strict marching orders they were um in perfect alignment they had every tribe separated and they everybody knew their job so there was no question that they were going the right direction and that they weren't lost. They're going exactly where God wants them to. And then they end up in this place. Okay? Right where God wants them at. So they... they, they ha See, the thing is, they had to have known, okay, now this is another test. But they didn't. And so, here's what happened. I want to stop and tell you. If you habituate an old man reaction to every pressure in life, you're no different than the Israelites right here in this situation. See, if you do something 20 times in a row the same way, you, you don't even have to think about it. it it's habituated. You do it from uh, subconsciously, you make an application. And uh, so what do, you, what do you have to do to be able to break that? you got to see, spiritually, you've got to change. You've got to change to the new man. And you've got to have a new man response. And the, the horror is, is that it's hard to change. And that's so that you have to hit the brakes and you have to say, wait, let me think. I've got to make a new man response to this pressure situation. And so let me stop and think about this. God's got me right where He wants me. And now I have to make an application of Bible doctrine to life experience. Now, you've got to do that 20 times in a row before it becomes a subconscious new man habituation and that's what christian maturity is god's going to lead you through the desert where he gets you 
where you can apply without even thinking about it before you take the witness stand. So the moral of the story is, is that are you making an old man subconscious reaction to every pressure situation in life? Or are you stopping and you saying, thank you, Father, for another opportunity to flex my spiritual muscle. Here it is. I'm smiling at the opportunity. And see, there's very, very few Christians that can stop and smile in adversity knowing that this is just another opportunity. See? So in chapter 17, they're right where God wants them. They're there because of obedience. And uh, it's going to be another test. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses. They maribod and said, Why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And see, they couldn't see it as a, another opportunity to flex spiritual muscle. All they could see was Moses standing right there, and he was making a good somebody to chew on. And don't forget this if you're leadership. Somebody is always looking for somebody to chew on. Don't take it personal. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What should I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. I like that. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before them. Make a good target. Stand right out in front of them, Moses. They're ready to stone you. Just stand right out there. Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the rod which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. Now, that word for rock is a, a technical word, to sur, T-S-U-R, to sur. And it means jagged rock. And it says, You shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And so we see that the rock here is Christ. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us that this rock is Christ. And that Jesus even says that... Uh, Life-giving waters will flow from the believer, uh, the born again. And so, here to Sur is Christ upon the cross where, where God the Father struck him with the sins of the world. And the life-giving water that we drink is salvation that came from the cross. And uh, the question is, is obedience a dead end? And you may say to yourself, well, I follow God my whole life. I'm right here in this situation, and uh, now it seems to be bleak. And the truth is, we have to be different than the children of Israel who complained about no water when they knew that God could deliver them from any situation. See, God can deliver you from no water, bitter water, too much water, all of the situations, and they could not see it as an opportunity to flex spiritual muscle. And uh, God delivered them again in grace. Now you've got to turn over, for test number five, you've got to turn over to Exodus 32. See, all of these tests were designed by God to prepare the Israelites for the promised land. And God intends for you to go to the promised land in this lifetime. But you can't go there as a baby. You've got to have the spiritual maturity, the muscle of walking through the desert. I don't know if you've ever walked through the sand, but it'd make your calves cramp. 
and getting up every day and marching through the sand would make those legs really tough and make those calf muscles just explode, man, get really big. They had perfect nutrition so that they had great health. The Bible says their shoes didn't wear out, neither did their clothes. God provided for them in every way. So you can see these Israelites marching out across the desert to take the next test. Or oh, they weren't looking for a test. They were just trying to get out from under pressure. Exodus 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, see he's gone up to get the Ten Commandments. The people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that should go before us. For as for this Moses the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. People rose up to play, it says in the New Testament. There's nothing like some paganism, some heathenism, to mix into your Christianity. Just what happens today. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Go to church on Sunday, live like a heathen the rest of the time. The Israelites in the deserts were ready to turn to other gods. And you say, well, I don't worship idols. Well, what is number one on your priority list in your own soul? That's where your idol is sitting. If it's not Bible doctrine, there's something up there. You're no different than the Israelites in the desert, see? And Aaron said to them, he was, just, he was willing, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So they brought all the gold, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it into an engraving tool and made a molded calf. That was one of the gods of Egypt. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Wow, I can't believe God didn't kill them all right there. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now, see, this is false doctrine. It takes a partial truth and twists it. That's the way Satan loves to work. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Uh, he goes on in the, in the rest of the chapter. And uh, At some point, yeah, in verse 20, he says, He took the calf which they had made, burned it with fire, ground it into powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. I like that. Grabbed him by the hair of the head and made him choke it down. Well, there was a... The question is, what is the test? Test number five is invisible authority. Invisible authority. In verse 28, you see what happened. The 3,000 of them ended up dying. And just as a child who moves out of the home under the visible authority of their parents into uh, college or wherever under the invisible authority of God, it's a transition that's hard. The Israelites had slave, they had slave drivers, taskmasters in Egypt, and now they're moving out into the desert and they don't have anybody telling them what to do. God has just given them some commands and they can't see God. Now Moses is going on top of the mountain. Who knows if he'll ever come back. So they went AWOL. They went haywire. But just as the prodigal son got into a famine, 
So we also, when we tell God, so long God, I'll see you in eternity, God sends a famine. He sends pressure. And the question is, will we salute legitimate, invisible authority in our own life? That is God and His Word. Or will we be forced to drink the poison water of divine discipline our whole lives, see? And that's the test, invisible authority. Well, I made it to uh, the point where I generally take a break, so we'll take a break right there before we look at test number six and Israel in the desert. Let's take a five, at least a five-minute break. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're taking a look at the idea that the Israelites, two million strong, went out into the desert, the wilderness, where God is going to prepare them to inherit the promised land. The question is, would they use their own volition to trust God, to overcome, to maintain maturity, and walk across the Jordan dry shod, or would they succumb to negative volition? Chapter 33, Exodus 33 is test number six. The, the question is, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. So he is telling them, Look, this is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. I promised this land to them, and I'm going to bring you into it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Pezzarite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst lest I consume you on the way, for you are stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned. They were scared to go into the land because all of these people were bigger than them. They had better armies. They had uh, securities. They had walls and fortresses and these things and weapons. And God is promising them that He is going to drive them out before them. And they mourned. They weren't willing to march on. It's amazing how God has protected America while other countries of the world have gone through all kinds of wars and tribulations. We have been protected. Have you thought about the, the people of Ukraine right now who are sitting in their own country and uh, there's a hun over 100,000 Russian troops on the border of Ukraine right now? waiting to invade. We have experienced the kind of national security that could only be given by God. It's amazing what we have received. And uh, the idea is that we ought to know that God has protected us and that He will continue to do so as long as we function as client nation. We're looking at test number six in the battle is the Lord's. The Lord is the only one that can protect the United States of America. The question is, do we deserve it? And uh, one of the reasons that I'm in ministry right now, I was driving to church and people would question why Brad would want to teach the Bible. And the answer is, you know not where your freedom comes from. You don't know where your freedom and your prosperity comes from. 
It's the grace of God that we have lasted this long. And the only reason that we're experiencing prosperity today is because we're riding the coattails of the previous generation of super grace believers, the blessing that they have called down from God. And uh, the truth is, I don't know that we can cultivate a new generation. There's not enough people my age interested. You don't know where your freedom and your prosperity comes from. That's why I drive up here on Sunday morning and Wednesday night and teach the Bible. I could stay busy doing a lot of other things. You don't know where your freedom comes from. And so, test number six is the battle is the Lord's, and we have really been blessed in America. The question is, how much longer will it endure? Now, test number seven, you have to switch to a new chapter. It's Numbers chapter 11. Numbers 11. You've got to turn over to Numbers 11 to get test number seven. Numbers 11, the test is the strength to march, the strength to march. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and His anger was aroused. Can you tell how bad it is to have a bad attitude in life? And uh, attitudes are infectious. Have one worth catching. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire was quenched. And so uh, we see that God supplied them with the strength to march in uh, chapter 10, and they complained. God consumed them. There's always a... <clears throat> I love how God designed the uh, planet Earth. Have you ever thought about that? That our, our day is 24 hours by design? And that uh, one full rotation of the Earth is 24 hours? But you're in a human body and you're riding this planet at a high rate of speed. And that God gives us night time to rest. And did you know that it says that His mercies are renewed in the morning? It's no coincidence that God left us on planet Earth with a 24-hour day, with a night time where we can rest, and when we wake up in the morning, the Bible says we experience new mercies, the strength for today. And so God continually pours out His strength into us, he supplies us everything we need to march through the day. And all we have to do is trust in His grace. And that is sufficient. Test number eight is, Can I be satisfied with God's daily provision? In verse four. Can I be satisfied with God's daily provision? Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving, so that the children of Israel also wept again, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? So this means that uh, even though they had the perfect food in the manna, it was... Some people didn't like manna. And it wasn't because it wasn't good. It's because they rejected God's provision. Bible doctrine is the same way. Bible doctrine is perfect. It's the Word of God, the mind of Christ. Bible doctrine is how God makes love to us in this lifetime. The Word of God is God's love letter to humanity. And some people don't like God's love. They don't, they don't like His love. They don't like His love letter. They reject it. Not all Israelites like manna. Not every believer likes Bible doctrine. 
In verse 5, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, and the cucumbers, melon, leeks, and onions, and garlic. But now the whole being is dried up, and there is nothing except this manna before our eyes. Bible doctrine, they hate it. And that's what religion does. It turns you against doctrine, and it brings you to the dryness of life. Now manna was like coriander seed, and its color was like the color of bedellum. The people went about and gathered it and ground it on millstones and beat it on mortar and cooked it in pans and made cakes of it and its taste was like the taste of a pastry prepared with oil. Donuts! Amazing. And when the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna fell on it. And so these people were dissatisfied with manna even though it was perfect. Well, you see that uh, the people who were sour, they went out and God sent uh, the quail and the uh, people who ate it got sick and many of them died. And so this was the idea of, see, do, what do you think of Bible doctrine? There, there's, two answer, there's two questions on the test of life. First, what do you think of Christ? You answer it one time. It determines your eternal residence. What think ye of Christ? And then the second question on the test is what do you think of Bible doctrine? You'll answer it every day afterwards. See, this was the attitude towards manna. And so, can I be satisfied with God's daily provision? That's test number eight. And test number nine is in chapter 12, Numbers 12. It's the test of jealousy. Test number 9 is jealousy in Numbers 12. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble more than all men who were on the face of the earth. And I want to remind you that Moses spent 80 years cultivating humility. His first 40 were being born and raised in Egypt. His second 40 were being a shepherd. And now his third 40 are with the Israelites. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. And he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I will speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, please do not lay this sin upon us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one of the dead, whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had bit but split her in face, would not she be shamed seven days? Let her shut out of the camp seven days. 
and afterwards she will be received again. And so seven days the, uh, she remained leprous and then God let her back in. So the idea is jealousy is a terrible sin. Jealousy is a, a terrible sin and uh, jealousy is the root cause of uh, socialism. And uh, our children have to be taught do not get eyes on other people's things, other people's circumstances, and to be happy with what you have. And the fact is, is that uh, jealousy is another cluster of sour grapes. And there are a lot of people in the United States of America who would like to just string up all the rich people. They're out on a witch hunt for rich people. Pay your fair share, they say. And it's uh, amazing to see the attitudes of the younger generation in America, even Christians, who don't know enough of the Word of God to know that God has set forth a tax code in the Bible. And they have no idea what it is. And they're out on a witch hunt for rich people. Well, jealousy is a terrible sin. We had to pass the test of jealousy. Well, test number 10 comes in chapter 14, Numbers 14. It's the horrors of negative volition. The spies had gone out into the land and remember that Caleb and Joshua were in that uh, mission and they had a good report but there were some weak believers there and they had a bad report. So in chapter 14, so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept at night. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation to them, if we had only died in the land of Egypt, or if we had only died in this wilderness. Why? There's your key word. Why? Why me? Oh, poor pitiful me. No one has ever gone through this before. Why me, Lord? Complete arrogance. Negative volition. And this reminds me of a axiom in the Christian way of life. All suffering in the Christian way of life is designed for our good. When we come in contact with hardship, we ought to be able to, we ought to pause and we ought to ask, what is God's meaning and purpose in this? I know it, this is in His plan for my life. What is its purpose? Not why me. It's arrogance. Why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt so they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And here's you a good point. The weak will always trade freedom for security. There's a whole generation that is willing to trade their freedom, which is precious and hard to obtain, for security. Verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But, thank God for the buts. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneth, who were among these, had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, 
then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Our protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. So, you had, test number 10 is the horror of negative volition. God had prepared these people. He had done everything in, uh, to deliver them all along the way. All they had to do was march across the, the River Jordan, dry shod, and God is going to give them uh, specific directions on how to overcome the people of the land. And you can see it when Joshua, uh, when they uh, went into uh, the promised land, God delivered all of the people into their hand. And he, uh, he made a way. If you turn over to Numbers 22, Verse 20, Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did at Egypt and in the wilderness have put me to the test now these ten times. So I've given you the ten tests that Israel took ten times and have not heeded my voice. That means they'll not inherit the land. They shall certainly not see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But, verse 24, my servant Caleb, because he was a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites, and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel make against me. And so you see, only two out of two million walked across the River Jordan. Two out of two million. What's so amazing about the story is that it's reiterated in the New Testament. Turn over to 1 Corinthians. You say, you did all that, Brad, but man, I don't know. That's Israel in the desert. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Paul tells us this is, has a direct application to our lives. 1 Corinthians 10, 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, that's born-again believer, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers, that's believers from a previous generation, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So he's talking about the Israelites who went across the Red Sea dry shod. All ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Remember to sir? But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. And he goes on and he lists all the different tests that we just got through looking at. So what is he saying? He's saying that God has delivered us from Egypt 
And while we may be in the wilderness, see right here is our area of momentum testing. That God has intended for us to pass. He's given us every tool we need to pass these tests of life. And they're just warm-ups. They're not hard. They're not difficult. And when we become a professional at passing these tests, God is going to bring us right over into the promised land in this lifetime. In phase two, you can walk in the promised land. The only problem with the promised land is that that is where the giants live. And so we've, we've studied this week the idea of momentum testing in the desert, the warm-ups for maturity, and next week when we come back, we're going to look at what it's actually like to go into the promised land and slay the giants. Okay, I thank you for your attention and attendance.